Thanks for stopping by. On YouTube, I'm known as XJW Curious, but my friends call me Pete. Stephen Lett has been a member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses since 2001. Before that, he was a regular pioneer, a Bethelite, a special pioneer, and a circuit overseer until returning to Bethel and being installed as a governing body member. He claims to have been one of the anointed since he was 21 or 22 years old. To anyone who has ever seen a video of Stephen Let talk, the first question is always about the unique facial expressions he makes. Here are a few screenshots showing a variety of his facial expressions. Many people speculate as to the cause of this mannerism. A friend of mine even told me it was because Stephen's son is deaf and the exaggerated expressions help communicate with the child. We will see a bit later in the video that Stephen has no children. In fact, he has no parents, siblings, nieces, or nephews who are hearing impaired. One of Stephen's nieces, in an interview with Lloyd Evans, answered this question from Lloyd. Is it, is it natural? Is that naturally the way he speaks when he's speaking in this extremely mellow, dramatic way on camera? Has he always spoken that way for, for the whole time you've known him? Only when he's speaking in public. His niece says Stephen talks normal, except for when public speaking. To support her claim, I found this video of Stephen talking about the then-current war building project. Watch this. If we look at the history of those taking the lead, they've never been sentimental toward material things. Uh, they were willing to move the headquarters from Pennsylvania to New York. Um, they've been willing to sell buildings. They've been willing to buy buildings. See, they're always thinking, well, what's best for Kingdom Enterprise? We can see that in a normal conversation, Let speaks quite normal. Apparently, his melodramatic technique, then, is nothing more than an act. As a member of the governing body, Stephen is often asked to speak to parents about ways to indoctrinate their children into the cult. One might ask, what qualifications does Stephen have to instruct others on raising kids? In that same interview, Stephen's niece verifies he has no children of his own. He has a lot of opinions about children and about the raising of children as someone who doesn't have children. Yes. And I can't help but wonder whether his approach to um, indoctrination materials and propaganda aimed at children might be a little bit tempered if he understood more or had more interaction with children as a parent and, understand, and, and, and understood a little bit more about what is or isn't age appropriate. Right. No, I would agree. I agree with you. And I think that is also his interaction, even in private time with our family, it's a normal person's reaction to that doesn't spend a lot of time around children. As Stephen's niece, who has two daughters of her own, she knows firsthand that Stephen doesn't know how to handle being around children. Lloyd probes a little deeper with this. He's not around children much. He doesn't have children. And furthermore, when he speaks about children, he, it becomes quite clear that he kind of doesn't like them. Uh, has that ever come across to you uh, when you've observed him interacting with children? Well, it's a very, it's a very perfunctory interaction. I like how she seems amused at the question, then replies, I think it's a very perfunctory interaction. 
For fun, I looked up the definition of perfunctory. Some of the synonyms made me chuckle a bit. Does Stephen Let have kids? No. Does Stephen Let like kids? It's hard to say, but by all accounts, it seems as though he wants as little to do with them as possible. And what about the picture in the thumbnail? A photo op that he posted on his Facebook page. Fraud. It's pretty clear Stephen doesn't know a lot about children. To give him the benefit of the doubt, let's hear him talk about something he's more familiar with. Materialism. Stephen says here that materialism is a tool Satan uses to pull Christians away from the Watchtower organization by indoctrinating them into thinking possessions and happiness are linked together. Oh, here's one, materialism. Now this has brought down many elders, ministerial servants, pioneers, publishers, very successful crafty act of the devil. It's no coincidence that this world is powerfully geared to promote materialism. Relentless advertising messages are designed to indoctrinate deeply the idea that acquiring abundant material possessions and acquiring happiness are inseparably linked. Stephen must believe that because in 2013, he and his wife bought a half million dollar home along with Stephen's brother as an investment property. Don't believe me? Look at this clip from the Blue Envelope channel. We see him pop up again in 2013. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. So in October 2013, Tim, Steve, and Steve's wife Susan go in together on a $500,000 waterfront property in Gulf Shores, Alabama. And uh, as we can see, they split it. 50% ownership by Tim and 50% by Steve and Susan. And so the doc specifically calls out that it won't be Tim's home or even a second home, and it's not going to be Steve and Susan's home either. This is, as far as I can tell, strictly an investment property. In a later video, the status of the property as an investment property was confirmed in tax records. How does a member of the governing body acquire $250,000 of investment money. Remember, all residents of Bethel, including the governing body, are required to take a vow of poverty. Lloyd Evans read the vow directly from the Bethelites' handbook. This is a booklet that's given to all Bethelites, and you're supposed to hand them in if you ever leave Bethel, Fortunately, one Bethelite sent me this for my collection, and it's the rule book for Bethelites, and it contains, on page 15, I don't know whether you can see there, it contains the vow, a vow of obedience and poverty, and let's have a look, shall we? <laughs> As an ordained minister wholly dedicated to Jehovah God, I hereby express my solemn desire to be recognized as a member of the worldwide order of special full-time servants of Jehovah's Witnesses, the order. I vow as follows, and if we scroll down to points five and six, to abstain from secular employment without permission from the order, to turn over to the local organization of the order, all income received from any secular work or personal efforts in excess of my necessary living expenses, unless released from this vow by the order. How convenient that Stephen Lett can release himself from the vow 
while enforcing the strict rules on the thousands of Bethelites who were doing slave labor. What a hypocrite. His hypocrisy regarding materialism goes a step further, though. Listen to this talk. Um, we're familiar with 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8. So having food and clothing, and the footnote adds shelter, we will be content with these things. So contentment really protects us. And in effect, that's what Jehovah was telling Barak. He was telling him, you have what you need. Stop storing up great things or seeking great things. Be content with what you have and do more important things. And then he gave a powerful reason why Barak should do this. Jehovah told him in Jeremiah 45, 5, for I'm about to bring a calamity on all flesh. So if you get the mastery over this, I will grant you your life as a spoil. Well, the same applies to us, doesn't it? Uh, Jehovah is soon going to bring a calamity on all flesh, and so we need to be content with what we really need and seek first the kingdom. We're just temporary residents, aren't we? To me, it sure doesn't seem Stephen is heeding Jehovah's advice. He seems to be stocking up income property, but I digress. At the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention, Stephen gave a talk that, based on outward appearances, may have seemed shockingly homophobic to some. Let's join in and watch another part of the interview with Stephen Let's Niece. I think we need to talk about your brother. Yes. Um, and this is obviously a story that Stephen won't want people to hear. Um, but it's directly relevant, especially in light of some of the comments that Stephen made um, at the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention. There will be many others who will come back who will have to abandon their former way of life. I was thinking, as an example, a homosexual. Now, this former homosexual comes back in the resurrection, and he really thought, and he, he was taught, and he came to believe that God accepted him with that lifestyle. But now he's going to learn about Jehovah's moral standards. And he's going to learn that Jehovah will not lower his standard to accommodate us. We have to come up to Jehovah's standard. Will he change? Will he adjust? It'll be up to him. But you brothers and sisters will help such ones to enjoy life eternal. All must learn to walk in Jehovah's righteous ways and willingly choose to do so. But now what if someone refuses to make the necessary changes? Well, the Watchtower commented on that. It said, after being given ample time, maybe even a hundred years, to seek God, some will show that they refuse to practice righteousness. Justly, they will lose life in the new world as we can see from Isaiah 65, verse 12, which says, And the sinner will be cursed, even though he is a hundred years of age. But we expect this will be the minority, that the majority will be delighted to make the adjustments so they can live in that wonderful new world. Stephen makes his stance on homosexuality pretty clear. What does that have to do with Brandy's brother, who is Stephen Lett's nephew? The interview continues. So, um, in your own words, uh, how would you describe that story? His convention part at the 2020 convention is actually what spurred me on to reach out to you because it was very upsetting for me. Because, so I have an eight-year younger brother. His name is Stephen as well. <laughs> so that may be a little confusing in telling this story. <laughs> but my brother, January of 2020, committed suicide um, because he was gay and had been disfellowshipped um, about nine, ten years ago. And 
shunned or from all the family. So those words that he spoke at the convention very much upset me. <laughs> Stephen Lett gave this homophobic speech after having his own gay nephew commit suicide. The talk was recorded in late April of 2020, just weeks after his nephew, unable to cope with the heartbreak of shunning, took his own life. Brandy tells us this in the interview. So you're under no doubts that it was the repression of his homosexuality and the, the way he was dealt with by the religion that caused his suicide. Yes, it was, there is no doubt in my mind because he wrote a letter and that was in it. So that is not me speculating, not even slightly. And this heartless, narcissistic charlatan has the gall to give this speech. While Stephen was a special pioneer in Illinois, he sold the car to a young man. Stephen took the opportunity to preach to the young man and started a Bible study with him. The young man got baptized, became an elder, and eventually he and his wife moved to where the need was great. The young man's name was Tim Mannion. Tim had a daughter, Chessa, who was five years old when the family moved. Years later, the story appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer. In a video on the Blue Envelope channel, we get a further narrative explaining more of the story. And he was moved that year to write a five-page letter to Steve Lett, who not too long before had been appointed to the governing body. And uh, basically in the letter, he, he kind of pleaded with Steve to use this new position of power and influence to change how the organization handled child molestation. Now, Steve did write back to his old Bible student, Tim, in June of 2002. In that letter, he sympathized with what the Mannions had had to go through and, you know, urged them to continue their faithful course in the organization. Uh, he did not really directly address at all changing the Watchtower policies. If we skip forward to 2015, that's when a talk from Steve appeared on JW Broadcasting. And in that talk, he used the opportunity to dismiss any talk that the organization was soft on pedophiles as ridiculous apostate-driven lies. Example, think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? If anybody takes action against someone who would threaten our young ones, and takes action to protect our young ones, it's Jehovah's organization. We reject outright such lies. The only lies here, Stephen, are coming from your lips. Let's review what we've learned about you in this video, shall we? First off, your exaggerated, melodramatic facial expressions are a fraudulent gimmick, as proven by your own niece. Second, you don't have kids and don't desire to be around them. Some justifiably say you don't like kids. Third, you enforce a strict vow of poverty on Bethelites while using your position to remove yourself from the vow. And while you beg Jehovah's Witnesses to send in money, you spend yours on personal investment properties, evidently not believing that the end is coming soon. Fourth, just weeks after your own gay nephew committed suicide, you take to a convention stage 
to condemn his kind to eternal damnation. And lastly, because of you indoctrinating Tim Mannion into this dangerous cult you help run, his family was destroyed. And although you have the resources and power to fix the situation, you did nothing. You and your seven cronies are hypocrites. Worse yet, you are dangerous cult leaders, and many of your actions are criminal. You lie, cheat, rob, and deceive the followers of your cult, threatening them with destruction in a fictitious event called Armageddon. You know it isn't going to happen. You lived through the 1975 debacle. My health is poor, and tomorrow is never a certainty for me. But I will use my last breath telling people what a dangerous cult the eight old men in Walwick are running. I will spend my last days warning people about you.